Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. I'm Katherine Cloninger, Director of Clinical Research Marketing at Parkcell, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our Workforce of the Future webinar series. Today, we're talking about statistical programmers, and we'll touch on recruitment, professional development, and retention strategies. Our panel today has dedicated their entire clinical research career to statistical programming and data management. Moderating the discussion is Yoon Hardiman, Vice President for Parkcell FSP. Yoon leads a global team of more than 450 statisticians and programmers across China, Taiwan, the US, UK, and India. Audra Hodges is Associate Project Director with Parkcell FSP. Audra brings nearly 20 years of experience in data management and statistical programming. Vaiba Sate is Associate Director of Statistical Programming with Parkcell FSP. Vaiba has worked for many years as a programmer before moving into the management side, where he oversees a large statistical programming team. So today's discussion is intended to be informal. There are no slides and there's plenty of time for Q&A. So please use the Q&A button on your screen to ask away. And there's a lot to talk about, so I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. It is truly my honor and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. You know, as you might know already, uh, there is a shortage of experienced talent pool in biopharma section. And at, at the same time, statistical programmers' job and roles are becoming more blended. You know, their requirement for statistical programmers have moved beyond even, you know, beyond basic statistical programming skill set to now more blending experience and needing more R or other similar program experience. And also having more detailed understanding of the clinical development process and also really needing more soft skills, that, for example, leadership skills, that, strong communication and also project management, organizational skill set, and also having strong ethics because at the end of the day, we are handling patient data. So we need to make sure that you know, our staff have such a strong ethics. You know, as you might know already, our competition right now to hire the statistical program is a fierce. And but many CRO company and biopharma sectors traditionally is neglecting those talent development at this time. So I'd like to utilize this forum to ask our panel Adra Vaibab from your experience for last more than 20 years, you know, how have you seen in the role of statistical programmer change and what are the knowledge gaps are you finding at this time? Maybe we can go from Adra first. Sure, thanks Yoon. Yeah, so there's been so much evolution in the clinical development process over the past decade and more, particularly with the introduction of new trial designs, more prevalent use of real world data, plus a plethora of biomarker and genetics data sources as we move farther down the path of precision medicine. And while the statistical programmers deliverables have remained fairly constant, the underlying work to deliver those outputs has certainly become more complex. So I think that the knowledge gaps that we're seeing or the, and the challenges that statistical programmers are facing uh, now really are around their ability to stay current with data standards and regulations and learning what they need to know about these various complex trial designs and disparate data sources that are now commonly used within the industry, all the while working to um, really move these therapies forward faster for patients. Additionally, on top of all of that, I do think that the statistical programming role is more out front now than maybe in, it has been in prior decades. So it's important to ensure um, what you mentioned, Yoon, about having programmers gain the soft skills that they need to be the most effective that they can be in their roles. And that does include communication, leadership, project management, and presentation skills. And I do think that all of this is even more important now, given the global virtual work environment that we find ourselves in. Um, Vaibhav, what would you add here? With that, I think there is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, really a shift from SAS to an R lately. Uh, R has been really around uh, you know, for more than 20 years, but the real movement to R is uh, been happening in industry now. 
Uh, there are a lot of companies who are shifting to utilize the R capabilities and you know incorporate that in their day-to-day -day programming activities. Also, you know, there are a lot of biopharma companies who are also now collaborating in development and advancement of R and using it for their statistical analysis. They are really trying to spend time, you know, working with each other to see how R can be further utilized uh, in the programming world. Uh, some many times, you know, we can use R for quick go, no go decisions uh, during the interim analysis or the futility analysis. So we really see that also getting picked up. Uh, R is also known for, you know, its data visualization and the graphics capabilities. Uh, which is also an added advantage for the, the quick turnaround that is uh, required. Uh, and last but not least, you know, there is a big difference in terms of the cost effectiveness between R and SaaS. As uh, you know, we all know, large corporations, large companies can certainly absorb the costs associated with using the SaaS, but the smaller companies or the startups, you know, are more likely to adopt R because, uh, you know, it can really meet their data analysis needs and, and are being an open source software, uh, there is no cost involved as compared to SaaS as well. So thank you so much, Adra and Viva, uh, for such a kind of really important kind of topics. So let me ask you a different question. So from your perspective nowadays, how do sponsors and the client, as their companies handling this kind of talent development for our staff? And what should we do something differently compared to other companies? Maybe. I'll ask Viba first your opinion. Sure, thanks, Sayun. So I think in the FSP space and also in the, the CRO world, you know, many times the talent development is an area traditionally neglected, mm -hmm. uh, but we need to really invest in our staff uh, and uh, you know work with them to develop their career paths. You know, whether it be a short term or a long term goal. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's really important for many of our team members. Like they really want to see that progress. In FSP space, you know, sometimes even there is a concern with some team members where they want to learn, uh, need to learn the specific tool, you know, dedicated to a particular company, particular pharma, and they are concerned about la loss of general programming knowledge. But it also comes with an advantage of, uh, you know, being able to work in an integrated environment, work with directly working with the pharma companies, uh, teams, and also, you know, having a chance to directly have interactions with them and work on multiple studies in the same compound. So you are able to learn uh, a lot more deeper, you know, gain further understanding on a particular, particular therapeutic area or a particular drug. So, you know, when staff members don't really see a long-term growth potential to align with their, what their professional goals are, then many times they are, you know, looking for a different opportunity, uh, you know, to seek that. So from, you know, a company's perspective, finding the right opportunity for the team member is uh, critically important for the talent development and the retention. You know, managers really need to understand what is the short-term goal or what is the long-term goal for their team members, you know, and, and then along with that, align the company's goals, uh, you know, that we have uh, with those individuals. Because by doing that, you are looking to meet the company's goal requirement and also the individual's goals requirement and overall, you know, have a happy employee to work for you. Uh, what are like, what would you like to add here? Yeah, yeah, I think that's true, Vaibhav. And I think many times our clients really are after the top level talent, but we found that having a mix of levels from junior up through principal um, is really beneficial because it does provide opportunities for our staff members growth and we know that it has a positive impact on both retention and long-term engagement of these staff members. Um, you and you actually have really great experience uh, implementing this practice within the program that you oversee. Can you share your experience? Yeah, of course, Adra. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. I was kind of waiting for uh, the question. So, you know, you know, FSP. Uh, this is kind of it can be new. It cannot be new. But you know, one thing. You know, I experienced in this uh, company uh, for Proxy FSP. Um, one of the accounts that I manage uh, kind of oversee, we have a programming engagement FSP, uh, dedicated to programming biostatistics. What we try to do, we kind of mix our junior and senior statistical programmer, even principal statistical programmer. 
And also, same for the line management team. Uh, we mix kind of junior level who might have less experience than senior line management team. Kind of we create a team like that. And also functional line management in this case, they are technical skilled leaders and they can be really extremely hands-on to support our team. So this way, having mixture of a junior, senior programmer, our junior programmer can really grow with a team together, with a account together from the beginning within Prox FSP. And this has been really successful for our uh, last more than 10 years. So for example, we have a, a lot of junior statistical program one and two level became like co-lead programmers in the clinical study and they become study lead program, leading the study. It's really based on their capability and experience that they have in previous uh, career. And you know, people ask me, how can they lead a study? How can become a day co-lead programmer for clinical study? My answer will be, you know, these are due to have excellent educational background. A lot of them has master or PhD program uh, degree, and also their strong desire to learn in the clinical study, and also their flexibility to learn more. And Many times I'm finding out our staff, they are willing to go extra mile to get the job done and find the truth in the data set. And they are extremely open to be innovative and creative. From my personal opinion, the innovation can come from top down as well as the bottom up. You know, I'm also learning from our junior level as well. We really have to increase our programmer, every one of them to be innovative and creative. And I want to ask, challenge all the management team, we really have to listen to our junior program, what they have to say. So typically when the client comes to us and ask in our opinion, what might be the best team for the client, right? It's really important to have a mix kind of, of different level, junior and senior level, so that we can have a balance and also we can challenge each other to do better and improve better. So Vibe Up, I know you are one of the main account leader in our company and you have one of the main account at this time. And I'd like to ask you to share your experience and also your personal journey that you had at Praxel. We're mentioning you, like we do hire mixed level of resources across uh, you know, different regions uh, based on the sponsor specific needs. Uh, previously, you know, there was a mindset uh, where you know people used to think that the lead will always be in uh, like US or in Europe, and the support staffs will really be coming from other regions. But uh, lately, you know, there is a shift in the market and the talent pool, and this is not no longer a requirement that uh, you know we need to follow that setup. So now leads are not really based on the region, but that is they are all really based on the experience and the skill set that you know that they bring and what they offer. So everyone has an equal opportunity to achieve what, what goals they have because everybody is going to be, you know, having uh, the same level of, uh, you know, expectations and the opportunity to, you know, deliver. We provide at Paraxel, you know, the right opportunity for everybody's self-development and the growth. And, you know, we also, you know, set up many sub-teams by asset. You know, we give them, uh, you know, a uh, right opportunity to learn more about a particular treatment, you know, get more and more involved in not just like one study in a particular uh, drug or therapeutic area, but across multiple studies. So this really gives them a chance to really, you know, understand the molecule and then, you know, really travel with the molecule as it develops and be able to, you know, learn a lot about it. We also want to, you know, give everybody a chance in terms of contributing uh, in the macros development, in the standards development, you know, help uh, indeed. This really helps to, you know, from the individual development perspective, as well as, you know, many times for the sponsor, because we are able to help uh, them to improve their processes, change the things and, and come with a fresh mindset, you know, the which uh, many times our sponsors really uh, appreciate. From my, you know, personal journey's perspective as well, if you see, I joined Paraxel back in uh, 2008 as a junior programmer. Uh, then at Paraxel, I really got a lot of opportunities to work on multiple projects. Uh, this really helped in my personal development. I also got opportunity to lead studies and, uh, you know, with gaining further experience when Paraxel was really looking to hire some additional, you know, uh, management folks. Paraxel was more than willing to, you know, give the opportunity to their internal team members. And that's how I got an opportunity to be a manager. 
And since that time, uh, you know, coming in as an associate manager, I have grown with the company. I've gotten a lot of opportunity to learn, develop, and also now, you know, leading a, a large account. So in, you know, Parexel, we really give, uh, you know, chance for the talent to develop and be able to, you know, perform to best of their, their abilities. So, you know, when companies provide this right opportunity to the individuals, this really helps in the, the talent development, as well as, you know, it's very important from the retention perspective as well. I think, I think this is so important for leaders. You know, one thing I learned in this company, we are creating a culture, we are creating an environment. Any, anybody has an equal opportunity. In a lot of questions that I get in, getting from the statistical programmer, one, when I interview them, they ask me, Yun, what can I do in this company? Can I be a global leader? My answer will be yes, absolutely, 100%. You know, we'll guide, guide your coding from the beginning to the end. But to me, as long as we have a right culture, right environment, anybody can be an excellent global leader and we are asking for that as well. So, my next question will be Adra and Vaiba. You know, we discussed those all those topics, and you know, what can we do better to develop junior level talent to the workforce of the future? So maybe before I ask Adra, um, you know, when I joined Proxer seven years ago from Small Pharma in California, one thing I really noticed right away in this company within Proxer FSP, we do have a continuous years outreach program and also internship program globally. And we do have a very clearly defined talent development program. We created a very clearly defined career path not only for the new joiners, but our current staff, not only including myself and new Viba, Adra, everybody wants to you know, improve better to go to the next level. And we wanna make sure that everybody has equal chance. We also provide everybody cross-functional career opportunity. You know, we have a lot of programmers, one and two level, they join in different country, but their educational background is amazing. Master degree in statistics. PhD program in public health statistics. So, but they join the programming team because they want to try in programming, but sometimes they wonder whether they can, you know, kind of go kind of cross-functionally to different functions, for example, biostatistic, and we welcome those opportunities to everyone as well. Uh, this year, I'm very proud to say Adra and I, uh, along with other leaders within FSP, we create a program called Next Generation Leadership Program, really focused on statistical programmers and statisticians that will really help their leadership skill that they really need. Many times as a statistician, as a programmer, you know, we have opportunity to present the data in public sector, public forum, public conference. And I wanna make sure that everybody is able to present their knowledge in public setting and really professional manner. So to me, the leadership program is extremely important. And I went through several programs already for the last 25 years, and it's been really uh, tremendous help for me as well personally. So I wanna strongly recommend to everybody. My next kind of uh, assignment will be, uh, we also need to search and develop the next new generation and region or country for statistical programmers where there is a strong educational background and also strong culture in learning and also culture where everybody's open to new opportunity and ideas. And that's what we are looking for at this time. So maybe Adra, if you would like to add some other point that I mentioned in here, it will be really great. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Yoon. Yeah, kind of to reiterate what you said, I do think that it's really crucial at this point that we are recruiting new graduates out of school, um, providing internships to upskill, upskill students who are looking at this as their future career path, as well as making sure that universities are aware of and promote work opportunities within this industry. And then in addition to that, you mentioned talent development and to find career paths. Um, I think that it's really important that we make sure we're doing that at the level of each individual staff member um, because it's, it's crucial to know where their interests lie and where they want their career to go long term. And whether that's 
in the statistical role, them staying on that path throughout their career, or potentially moving cross-functionally because there are a lot of opportunities within biostats as well as within data management and even potentially within data scientist types of roles or analyst roles. And then as you mentioned, uh, we did recently kick off our um, Next Generation Leadership Program for PARXL FSP, uh, which focuses on the further development of some of our high potential staff. So this is super exciting to me. Uh, the program is currently set to run for a set number of months. Uh, the focus is on graduating our cohort with uh, great leadership and presentation skills by allowing them to pair up with a mentor to research a topic of their interest within the leadership space. Um, I'm personally very excited to see, you know, how this cohort ends up growing throughout this process. And as a mentor myself, I've definitely learned a ton from the people that I've had the opportunity to mentor. So I'm really excited about that program. So I just want to share with everybody, if you are a programmer, if you want to become a programmer, you can be a global leader with the right mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we experience over and over again with Adra and Viba. So I really strongly encourage all the programmers, you can be the next generation leader for us. And I really strongly recommend it. So, you know, I'd like to ask Viba for your experience in or your opinion on real world data. Things are changing in the clinical domain right now. You know, we talk about our programming, we talk about some other programming, but real world data is something it's coming over and over again. So maybe um, Viba, can you maybe touch a little bit about real world uh, data evidence area that you had experience in the past and maybe looking into future statement as well? Sure. No, thank you, John. So now, as you talked you have, and you discussed, like real world data, uh, RD, RWD and the real world evidence like uh, RWE are really creating a lot of new opportunities for everyone. Uh, this is really a, a sort of a new field where you are now involved in picking up the, the data from the really day to day uh, life. And everybody, you know, really needs to be open about uh, these new things as they come up, you know, one thing that happens in, in this world consistently is that things are changing daily. So while, you know, clinical trials were the only way, uh, you know, of dealing with the data in past, but now using the real world data that is now available and data being collected at all these, you know, medical, uh, you know, doctor's places and other places, this is, you know, really happening in real time. And whether it be, you know, R or RWD, those are, you know, really causing a big change in how the you know, information is collected and uh, shared. So from the programmer's perspective, you know, one thing I would really like to you know, suggest to everyone that be open-minded, you know, uh, just say, don't think about SDTM and Adam creation alone. You know, also think about the different opportunities that continue to open up. For example, real world data, uh, real world evidence, uh, even using use of R, you know, this all really calls for an expanded skill set. So here at Parexel, we really, you know, look forward to recruit uh, like-minded individuals, you know, from other pro functions or, you know, from the broaden broad talent pool, you know. So clinical development, uh, you know, originally, as I said, was really structured, but now with the real world evidence, this calls for like a review or analysis of the data, which is really not in a structured format because it's not really coming from the clinical trials. So. Just to summarize, like everybody should look for these new opportunities as they come up and really jump on them because um, that's where you will be able to gain additional skill sets and have uh, you know additional things that you are able to offer. And like from your perspective, Yoon, would you like to uh, you know share some training programs, particularly for the junior programmers as well that uh, we at here at Parexel um, offer? Absolutely. And Viber, I like the when you mentioned be open-minded, right? As a programmer, sometimes we can be uh, kind of narrowed down a little bit, very small little data set, right? STTM, Adam data set, creation of TFL. But I'm on a, I want to challenge everybody, all the programmers out there. Let's have open-minded concept. Let's have a conversation. You know, data set can come from different shape, right? Different format. And we should be able to have a mindset to be open-minded, looking at the data, whether it's unstructured, structured data set, right? So um, 
the one of the account that I oversee and one thing I realized that for new joiners, it, whether they are junior level or senior level, we need to have a very strong um, kind of training program. Because when they join the company, when they join the new account, you know, sometimes some people might have a fear because they don't know what is coming. They don't know maybe uh, what they need to do at that time. So we have a very structured programming program from day one. Typically when new joiner join our company at Frax uh, and FSP account, we assign mentor-mentee relationship. So the mentee and the new joiner can go to mentor and anytime, you know, ask any question and, you know, get us some guidance from the mentor. So we train new joiners uh, for about three weeks uh, onboarding process and training going to be about, you know, two to three hours every day by the trainer, instructor training. During this training, new joiner should be able to program once they get trained a little bit, they should be able to program from SDTM data set, Adam data set and TFL using dummy data that we create in our training area, really building the confidence. Because to me, once you have a confidence, once you know how to figure out creating data set and TFL generation, you know, you should be able to um, kind of tackle all the difficulties and some issues uh, during the training program. You know, to me, once, you know, they build a confidence as a leader, we cannot stop their desire to do more. So this is something that I really want to focus on. And also, uh, our technical line manager will have a regular meetings with everybody new joiner and discuss any challenges they might have. Because in a, during the onboarding training, I mean, for me, I'm going to have a lot of questions, right? And I'm going to be asking a lot of questions to my management team or trainer. So I really encourage everybody, open-minded, come up with a creative thinking and ask all the questions. So for the trainers, it can be line majors, it can be senior programmers, it can be junior level who went through all the training programs with us because they already gone through those modules for three weeks. So we try to apply a train the trainer model. This model really empowers our employees. Everyone feel like they are key contributors. So Vibab, I know you are one of the excellent, uh, strong leader for one of the account. Maybe you can kind of share some of your experience that you went through. Sure. So I think, uh, you know, from the, uh, you know, from Paraxel side, we really, want to understand that and, and acknowledge that not every individual just likes to work on a clinical trial alone. You know, they, you know, some like to do the study programming. Some also have additional goals. You know, they want to pick up leading studies. Some are interested in like standards uh, or the macros development. Some have excellent or great ideas on the process improvement. And some, you know, really would want to move into the line management role. So everybody has different, you know, goals, different things that they want to achieve. And we need to really give, you know, right opportunities for that talent to develop. You know, talent is just not going to come in a flash. You know, you need to give people opportunities, experience, you know, let them gain, you know, knowledge so that they would be able to perform and deliver in, in those aspects. So when it really comes, you know, to talent, you know, many times, you know, the grass is often greener in your own backyard. But many companies, you know, fail to understand this. They really consider the staff as a replaceable commodity, you know. So, but those who really do understand the importance of talent development and giving the right opportunity to all the individuals are able to succeed at the highest levels. So it's really important for every company to be successful, to develop the talent from within and, and not like, you know, just let people come in and, you know, do the work for a few uh, you know, years and let them be able to just walk out. So talent development becomes the most important aspect in, you know, uh, you know, retaining the pe people as well. So with that, like, you know, I would like to leave you with one of the famous uh, Richard Branson's quote, uh, you know, that we here at Paraxel really strongly believe in, you know, train the people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough so they don't want to. Thank you, Vaiba. I think, I think that's the highlight, right? Uh, we train our members pretty well, but also, you know, we, we treat our employee with respect, right? 
Uh, to me, from my personal experience, even though we have a different structure, a different title, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a programmer, I'm a statistician. I like to have a conversation with our staff, one-on-one -on -one level or group level, and also talk about their career development plan, right? Not everybody wants to become a major. They want to be sometimes technical leader, technical contributor. So we really um, have to customize for individual need and what they like to do for their future. And that's the key for line majors to have a very close relationship with our staff and one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's, that's where we have to create those kind of environment for everybody. So Adra, Vaiba, thank you so much for your really honest opinion and also kind of key point that you touched from your experience. You know, I'd like to take opportunity to say really appreciate Vibe of Adra for this great discussion. I know that I work very closely with you both and, you know, Proxy is very lucky to have you as a leader for FSB. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Catherine for the Q&A session. Thank you, Catherine. Well, I'd like to thank you all for such a thoughtful discussion. And we already have a few questions uh, waiting for you. So, Yoon, I'm going to start with you. Yep. Um, can you tell us what regions are in the highest demand and how you might see this changing over the next few years? Wow. So, Kat, this question I'm getting almost daily <laughs> from the client and also from uh, internally as well. So, you know, as an operational leader, I work very closely with our talent recruitment group. Uh, our uh, kind of HR group as well, and because we have a global footprint. And so the way I see right now, currently, USA is one of the main country for many talent the client is asking for. There are many strong leaders in USA. In addition to that, um, you know, APEC China, also Taiwan, India, Eastern European country like Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Western European country, UK, France, Spain, in other countries are the highest demand from the client at this time. So everybody asks me, what happened next within the next five years, 10 years? What do you see? Um, the way I see it will change, it will change definitely along with the countries that I mentioned. But it will change the countries where we can really identify strong technical skill set and also the key is strong educational background, statistical background, programming background. Those educational background are going to be very important. So, for example, Australia, Southeast Asian country like Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, and Latin America. And um, Canada is one of the worst rising countries as well. So Adra, Vaiba, would you like to add any comment in here or maybe we can go to the next question if you like. Yep, good from my standpoint, Yun. I think, yeah, you covered everything, Yun, that I had in my mind as well. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. Well, for the next question, I think any of you are qualified to answer it, but I'll ask Audra to take the first stab. Um, how has COVID changed your recruitment? Okay, that's a good one. Um, so I would say recruitment definitely looks different now than it did two years ago, per se. Uh, I think that what we're seeing right now is a demand for clinical study resources currently being significantly higher than the supply that we have. Uh, market valuation is at an all-time high right now. Uh, certain roles like biostatisticians at the senior level, same for stat programmers, is in very high demand, which causes our candidate pools to shrink, which causes bidding wars with most offers. So it's a very challenging market. And Bye Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, COVID has changed uh, it a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, it has added to the COVID fatigue. You know, it has caused an imbalance in like work-life balance for many people. Uh, yeah. Remote work, remote working is now much more common, you know, uh, in this uh, current times or, or even in the post-COVID times now uh, for, you know, across all countries and regions. Previously, there were certain countries and regions where, uh, you know, working from office was sort of a requirement or mostly being done by all employees. 
but now for last uh, year and a half, uh, everybody has been working remotely. So it has its own advantage and challenges, uh, you know, working remotely, people are able to save time, but also there are challenges across like just being at home and working sort of all the time. There is, uh, you know, many times, uh, uh, you know, unre unrealistic candidate expectation as well. So, you know, uh, and poaching of the talent has become very common because as, as you order rightly mentioned, the uh, demand for the, the current resources are significantly outweighing the, the current supply. So, um, you know, poaching becomes a, a very part and parcel of that. Yeah. Also, you know, candidates uh, sometimes are requiring a very high compensation uh, request. So uh, that becomes uh, an added challenge with regards to trying to meet uh, or keep pace with uh, this whole like sort of a cat and mouse game where you're trying to recruit the people in, in the right fashion. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I, I think that to address the challenges that we're seeing as far as recruitment goes, uh, kind of planning ahead for the future is developing relationships with universities. And Parkcell has, has been working on this for sure to build a talent pool of people in the universities, whether that's undergraduate, graduate, or even postgraduate students for key internship and placement positions in different areas within our organization globally. I think that, you know, doing that is going to help pave the way for the future as we continue to recruit, like as we've always done in this high demand market. So maybe Adra, can I make a make one comment. So yeah. because COVID-19, some of the staff, I think, because we have a global footprint, so some countries where everybody used to go to the office every day, nine to five job. And also, but now because COVID-19, you know, everybody, a lot of them is working from home. So there is a change, definitely. So one thing I really mentioned to my team member that line major has to be available for our staff, have a close relationship and check on our members one on level, make sure that we care for them, right? Because you know things happen, you know, unfortunately in this case, but I think as long as we do care for our staff and make sure that, you know, they feel like we are listening, you know, at any time. Right, I think those relationships gonna make a big difference in this difficult situation. Right, absolutely, you and I think uh, being flexible. I think mm -hmm. that's the, the key thing. You know, yeah. working with your team members, and, and that's what we you know really look forward to for our all of our line managers to do. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Great insights. Um, so for the next question, I'm going to combine the two very similar ones. Um, because they, they, they do have some, some similar insights. So the first part are just the key requirements for st statistical programmers. And then um, alongside of that, how can a non-statistical technical person kind of participate in this workforce of the future? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. Vai Vai, you wanna, you wanna lead off with this one? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Catherine. So I think the first part of the question where you, uh, you know, asked with regards to requirement for a statistical programmer, in these current times, you know, the one important thing is that trials are getting more and more complex and more and more different technologies are getting available for programmers. So a programmer really needs to work on a continuous development, uh, you know, of their skills to keep up with this market demand. And, you know, for the new graduates uh, or anyone moving into the programming field, you know, you really need to always trust yourself um, and things that you have learned uh, and, and those are you, you are able to apply to your day-to-day -day work. You know, you need to really capitalize on every opportunity and added responsibility with regards to, you know, uh, you know achieving these greater heights, you know. So the people who might not be having the, the background of experience or, or are really looking to come into this field they, you know, we have this, you know, uh, junior level programmers, uh, you know, mentor mentee relationship and additional programs that you was talking about earlier. So we do really value bringing in the junior staff and letting them grow uh, into the company, you know, letting them come in, learn how we do the things, how, you know, we uh, do the programming, even in many cases, and also to be able to, you know, uh, gain further and further experience because many times when you're coming outside, you know, fresher, you just really, really don't know, you know, where you want to go. 
So once you get involved, you start to learn about, uh, you know, what the statistical programming is all about. And then, then that really leads to, you know, you to define what is your interest area, whether you, uh, you know, really like to get more and more technically skilled, whether you are looking to move into the line management, whether you are interested in, you know, more macro standards development. So it's more of like, you know, being open-minded and flexible to come in and, you know, then to learn the things that you really are interested in. Uh, or, or like you and you want to really give any more advice on uh, these points? Yeah, yeah so I, you, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, go ahead, Adra. <laughs> okay, well, I was just gonna add there as far as uh, somebody who may have be a non-statistical type of person, you know, programming extends beyond statistical programming. And so kind of what Vibov, Vibov was saying is you can get your foot in the door working within the data management group doing supporting programming tasks uh, just to kind of ta start taking that step towards, you know, what your interests are and where you want to go with your programming career. I, I think that we're in a day and age now where there are so many opportunities within this industry that's well beyond just the st statistical programming role as it's traditionally been defined. Yeah, so thank you, Adra. So I just want to share with everybody, those who believe that they don't have a technical skill set, uh, actually you're wrong. I would just say, as long as you have a strong desire to learn to be better, you can be very successful. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a strong programming skills that I never had from the beginning. I was more theory type. But when I joined the company a long time ago, I had an extremely strong desire to make it happen. And I learned from the beginning. After 24 years of experience, am I stopping my learning? The answer is no. You have to learn every day. So as long as you have a strong desire, you can be very successful. So let's have a conversation. I can make you uh, change a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Great thoughts about being just a lifelong learner. Um, so along a very similar theme, I'll ask you to, to take the next question. Just, you know, what's important? Um, what do you look for when you look for qualified candidates? Hmm. So maybe uh, I can answer um, for this one because I interview kind of weekly base. And, you know, for, for me, for example, through the interview, um, you know, everybody has a technical skill. Everybody has educational background, minimum background, right? So what I'm looking for further than that, um, I'm looking for characteristic. I'm looking for personality, how they answer difficult questions. Because as a programmer during the clinical study, you're gonna be in many difficult questions. I don't wanna scare you away, but in the clinical study, it's very dynamic. So you are gonna get into some difficult question. So I'll be asking some difficult question, how you handle those situations. And also I'm looking for team player. Um, even though you are an excellent programmer, we have to work in the environment where we have to work with a statistician, data major, medical doctors, or other project management team. I'm looking for team player. And also I'm looking for leadership. It doesn't matter whether you have experience or not. I'm looking for potential leaders for the next generation. I'm looking for somebody who has organization skill set. I'm looking for somebody who has you know, good communication skill set. Even though you're a programmer, never underestimate your communication skill because you'll be in the position where you'll be presenting to the senior leaders uh, many times. So we ask many situational interview questions to the candidate. So nowadays what I do, I typically, some of my account, I team up with my line management team, like Adra is one of them. We typically team up with the two major, ask a question to our candidate, find out really whether candidate can grow into the leader at our Proxel FSP. And interview gonna be maybe last about one hour, one and a half hours. So Adra, maybe can you add, since we experienced together, this experience together many times, you might wanna add a few things. In addition to what you just said, uh, when we're interviewing, we are really interviewing from the standpoint of, is this, is this candidate a good fit for our specific client? Um, we know our clients, we know the roles and expectations of the positions that we're trying to fill. And 
we want to make sure that the candidate can be successful with that specific client in mind. Uh, and ultimately, because we know that if we hire the right candidate for our client, we're going to achieve greater success for the candidate and, st and then future staff member themselves, but also it will keep that staff member engaged for the long term. And I, I've found that, at least in my own experience, to absolutely be the way to go. Yeah, exactly. Well, that looks like it wraps up our Q&A in today's discussion. Um, but I wanna thank you all for such great insights on a pretty pervasive industry-wide challenge. So I just wanna uh, remind the audience to um, continue our webinar series. We'll be continuing this dis dis discussion every month with key roles um, in clinical research. So stay tuned for more. And if you have additional questions you didn't get to, please look on the contact information on the registration page as we'll be, we'll be happy to answer follow-up questions offline.